So I'm glad you brought up um, uh, Jim Clyburn because part of the consternation among the political left is that, yes, his endorsement, 50 percent of South Carolina voters said that it was pivotal to their choice to vote for Joe Biden. Majority of South Carolina voters also supported a universal health care system, which Joe Biden doesn't support and Jim Clyburn doesn't support. You know, this is a this is a difficult, this is a sensitive area because, you know, Jim Clyburn is an icon and an advocate in so many ways. But he also has been oppositional to universal health care. Some would argue because he has taken more money from the pharmaceutical industry than anybody else in Congress. Right. And so if we're unwilling to talk about the corrupting influences of money and the fact that our politicians aren't always making decisions on the base of their individual feelings, how can we speak to our community about who really is acting in their interests or not? <laughs> that, that's a million dollar question. And, and I mean, I, I think that, you know, much of this went even more further to the right or left once Citizens United was embraced by the Supreme Court. No one knows, anyone who knows, if we able to get more money out of politics, we'll probably be better off. I don't know the answer to that. I do know that that's part of the answer. That's where part of the answer lies. We've got a Republican Party that still is fully in trying to engage with President Trump uh, because they believe he has the, the, well, the voters have said, the, the Republican voters have said that, who also vote for them. And, you know, it, it's really a sad set of circumstances when you have a nation where a president has turned the people on the government in a way that is nothing wrong with turning on the government to say, look, we don't agree with this and the protest in a positive way. But when it becomes a negative kind of protest where you're trying to destroy people and governments and you bring guns and everything else, I mean, this, this is the most awful situation that we can be in. Now, the president today, Biden has a very unique opportunity, but he's got so many challenges. Uh, the question is, where do, you, where do you, you start? And And when you say, how do we hold them accountable? Well, you know, the nervous part of it is, you know, God forbid if you allow and decide I'm going to sit this one out two years from now. Um, we don't have that luxury either, but we've got to find a way I, 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 to, to, to really, you know, continue to put pressure on, on, on the administration. And I, I hadn't thought about it the way that you are articulating it in terms of how do you do this? when you have stabilized forces that are really not neutral or, or not unbiased yeah. um, for legitimate, maybe someone would say legitimate reasons. I think we could, do, we could change the whole discussion by what I talked about earlier, some economic withdrawals. You say, well, you know, they may say, well, we didn't, we didn't do this to you, but you didn't do anything to help us either. Mm -hmm. so why should we support you? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've got to do something dramatic mm -hmm. uh, in such a way that we have more partners, because I believe that when corporations join with the cause, it's heard differently. Um, and all presidents ultimately capitulate to some degree. I mean, unless unless it's just something truly crazy, you know, and we didn't we didn't know what crazy was really until visibly crazy until we saw what President Trump was willing to do every day. I mean, just, I mean, every day you're, you're, you're like, oh my God. So today there's a semblance of stability and that's good, but onto that has to be built something meaningful that is delivered to the people. You say that we should do, we should have something big, right? We needed something big. And I, I think that I would agree with that. And I think that's part of why so many progressives are frustrated because it felt like, especially at the end of the primary, as COVID was ramping up, it was clear that we needed something big. It was clear that America, when pulled on the issues, wanted Medicare for all, wanted a $15 minimum wage, wanted a wealth tax. Talk about, you know, your father's amazing legacy and, and talking about income inequality and poverty, wanted to end militarism, you know, all and all of these things 
the person who was championing all of those things and had been championing them from a lifetime was Senator Bernie Sanders, right? right? And there were a lot of people who were very frustrated when Jim Clyburn stepped in on Joe Biden's behalf because it felt like a moment where if you thought you wanted something big, if you believed that in particular our community had these needs even more than other communities, disproportionately than other communities in the states, that you would have gone for a candidate or tried to support a candidate who had a long record of delivering instead of a candidate like Biden, who had advocated for Social Security cuts, who drafted the crime bill, who who made it so that student loans couldn't be dischargeable in bankruptcy, who was a real part of putting us in the situation that we're in over the course of his 40 year career. Eulogize Strom Thurmond, Anita Hill, all of these things. Right. So I'm curious, do you think we'd be in a better position if if we did have a, a candidate who had politics more like uh, Bernie Sanders politics? I think in, the, in terms of the long run, yes. I think for now we needed a stabilizing force and extremism of any side, left or right. Um, it's always good to have the potential for. But I think we need we need what we have right this minute. Is Bernie but, Sanders extreme? As, as someone who, you know, your father was called, you know, a communist. He was someone who identified as, you know, he said, you know, I'm more socialistic in my economic theory than capitalist. But he was talking about these same things. And you know, uh, Sanders, I, I'm not <laughs> personally saying I believe he's extreme. Uh-huh. I'm saying that I think the masses of people see mm-hmm. that. I think that, you know, you had one extreme running four years ago of mm-hmm. Trump and the other extreme of Bernie Sanders. You know, two extremes in 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 terms of how the public saw it. I mean, we have to go back and look at sort of what happened. I think Bernie Sanders was winning, um, and I'm not sure that Hillary Clinton was, but the Democratic Apparatus Party wanted her. Yeah. Um, and I wanted her because I thought we needed a woman president, number one, and I know she's extraordinarily just bright. Um, but again, Bernie Sanders may have been winning. And nobody talks about that. Right. Um, He won 44 contests, even with it very much, you know. So here we are, you know, four years later. And then he runs again. And I did not see him garnering the same kind of support this time. And and unless I'm just, you know, I, I saw some, but I didn't see enough. Well, it was a very divided field. So it took a long time to narrow it down. And then you saw the first three contests. There's some debate about Iowa and some shadiness, frankly, about the tools that were used there. But won the first three contests, including Nevada, with 70 percent of the Latino vote, which we saw became a really important voting bloc in the general election, but which was really dismissed by a lot of the press at the time. I remember... um, you know, Silla O'Brien, who is herself Afro-Latina, saying, well, let's wait until we get a state that's diverse and then we'll see what happens. Mm. And I remember thinking, well, gosh, Nevada is a pretty diverse state. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, a, it's relevant that Bernie is winning and overwhelmingly won also the non-white vote in Iowa. Iowa is only 10 percent non-white. But uh, the caucus is there with all of the um, a lot of East African um, and uh, Latino workers there uh, voted Almost like 90 percent for for Bernie Sanders and in those caucuses because of the grassroots organizing work that had been done there and because they're a very marginalized population that needed those policies desperately, just like black people. But our community um, has, I think, an allegiance to the Democratic Party that is unique and makes us different from Latino voters. And we care. We are very for reasons that aren't necessarily wrong. They're just it's just how it is. We care. We are likely to take the advice and guidance of the people who are leaders and figureheads in our own community, which puts an enormous responsibility on people who are those figureheads, I think, to speak truth to power about who is going to deliver and who won't for our community. And I think that's why there's some frustration around why it is why it is that people like, you know, Jim Clyburn chose to endorse Uh, Joe Biden, knowing what Joe Biden's record was like, or as other people like Jesse Jackson endorsed Bernie Sanders. That's right. Yeah. And and I'm I'm curious, you know, do you see yourself, do you feel pressure 
as someone so closely associated with your father's legacy to weigh in on those kind of debates? I don't know that I feel pressured to to weigh in because I, I quite frankly I I didn't. Mm-hmm. I was looking to see. I was trying to figure out at the time, you know, what is going to be the formula that wins because my focus was on doing all that I could to help get rid of President Trump. That was all I was focused on because I felt that. Um, you know, any of the candidates running would have been substantially better than what existed. You know, had I had a very close relationship with any of those candidates, maybe I would have jumped, gone along. But I, you know, I don't have a close relationship with Joe Biden. I, I don't have a close relationship with Bernie Sanders um, and none of the other candidates um, that I have a close relationship with. Um, ironically, you know, I had um, met with Kamala Harris earlier and, you know, felt, in fact, uh, several folks and I talked about when she dropped out that she po- she could possibly be in a position to become the vice presidential uh, designee or, 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 or the candidate who wins may choose her. And that ended up happening. So, it's just very interesting as you think about how how things happen. But I do believe, you know, I do believe that something is going to have to change because whether it's the leadership of Black Lives Matter um, or any number of us in the civil rights community, if we don't see some dramatic, not just engagement, but change, um, even in two years from now, it's going to be tough for the Democratic Party. Doesn't I don't mean that people will go to the Republican Party. I just mean that, you know, people may sit out. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure the president and the vice president understand that that luxury does not exist. You've got to keep people engaged. So we got to do enough uh, and more than we've ever done. Uh, and I think, you know, the Biden administration has the opportunity to do uh, things differently and and more. I think that, you know, in a real sense, you know, President Biden can do some things that President Obama could not, Mm -hmm. you know, because um, this is still a racist country. Mm -hmm. And if President Obama had tried some things that we would hope had hoped he had done, um, he would have been ostracized and maybe even put under the jail. So I think that there's still a different standard for white males than there is for blacks and women. So we still get a lot of work to do in our country. Uh, But again, we need to be very careful and look at, and, you know, I don't like to be critical of anyone, but I thought it was interesting that some Democrats, again, said the reason we lost seats was because of the progressive wing but the progressives were the ones that won. So right. that is to tell you something, your evaluation is a mistake in your evaluation. The progressives didn't lose. They could have, but mm-hmm. they didn't. They gained seats. So that means that there it's not a large trend, but there's a trending that is happening. And, you know, people want people who are going to deliver for communities to be elected. They don't want just the mainstream, whatever. I mean, although most a lot of people are, are attempting to be balanced. They're more, there's a huge scenario of balance. But the only way you make change is we have to push the envelope. I mean, my father and others taught us that. We have to keep pushing the envelope or nothing really is going to happen to make a difference. 